Hello, Bruce. Thank you for having me. Uh, so this is me, and sometimes I look at this picture and I ask myself, uh, why? What was going through my mind uh, when I dressed like this about 12 years ago, by the way? Um, uh, well, behavioral science can tell us, so psychological research can give us some indication as to why people dress a certain way uh, and what the psychological and behavioral effect uh, of that clothing is. And also that extends to other cues uh, that you might see, such as uh, music interests, uh, the types of emojis people use, the types of art they like. Uh, all of this can be used to kind of understand someone's personality and understand how they're likely to pr uh, or predict how they're likely to behave in the future. So, my name is Patrick, uh, but I do sometimes ask people to call me Pat because research says it makes me more likable. Um, so, hopefully that's working. Uh, people who use a shorter name or a nickname are seen as more popular uh, and more cheerful. However, using a given name is seen as more moral, so maybe I should do that. Um, and to give you an example of just how kind of uh, uh, how little conscious awareness and control we can have over our behavior is this great study where participants were told, come and wait in this room and wait for the experiment to begin. But what they didn't know was that the experiment had begun and they were being filmed. And what they found was after re the researchers shook their hand, they actually surreptitiously sniffed their hand. So they might be scratching their face or touching their nose, uh, but they could see from airflow uh, that they were actually sniffing their hand and they were significantly more likely to touch around their nose after a handshake than no handshake, uh, because uh, there's certain sweat and pheromones um, that are secreted from the hand, and when you shake hands with somebody, that information is then passed on, and we use it to, as kind of a cue, a subconscious cue as to their health, their hormone levels, and things like that. Um, so now, next time when you're meeting new people and shaking their hands, you'll know what you're doing. You'll know you're doing that, so you're welcome. <laughs> A little bit of background about me. Um, so I help apply, practically apply, um, kind of psychological science in academia. So on the academic side, I'm a part-time lecturer at two universities in London, uh, including London College of Fashion at UAL, um, and uh, also Goldsmiths. And I publish papers on things from price psychology, Facebook, uh, Facebook psychology, facial expressions. And academically, uh, sorry, commercially, these are some brands that I've worked with. Uh, here I'm using something called Social Proof, uh, so you think if he's worked with them, he must be good. So hopefully that's working too. Um, on the other side of the coin, uh, just to let you know, I was also lead psychologist contractor at Cambridge Analytica. So if you want to boo, please go ahead now, feel free. No? All right, well, you had your chance. Um, uh, so for example, one study I did for eBay, a PR study looked at the effect of background noise on online shopping finding that classical music makes you more likely to buy products because it primes you to see them as higher quality. Uh, likewise, if you hear the sound of birds singing, uh, you have higher purchase intent for a barbecue. Um, and it's a great example of how these kind of subconscious, uh, non-conscious factors can influence your perception of products and how you're likely to buy them. Um, and so that's the kind of thing I do. Mm, I also wrote a book uh, you can buy, uh, but you can also get some free copies here today. Uh, called Hooked, about the psychology of effective communications. So how to grab people's limited attention spans, how to engage them emotionally, um, and how to um, nudge behavior. So as well as hustling the book, I also wanted to ask if you had any idea why I put a pug on the front. So if we see something cute, uh, we'll instantly pay attention to it because it has uh, the features of a baby. So it's kind of vulnerable and small and a big head, that kind of uh, Disney aesthetic. Um, and from an evolutionary point of view, if we didn't pay close attention to cute things, uh, our babies probably would have been eaten by wolves and we wouldn't be here today. Um, and all of this can be used for good, so the power of behavioral science and data science, for example, being able to detect uh, depression through people's tweets. Uh, it's very easy to see a uh, positive data for good application there. Um, and then also kind of nudging people's behavior for the better. This is a great example. How do you get people to take the stairs and be a little bit more uh, exercise conscious? Uh, we'll make it fun to turn the stairs into pianos that make a noise when you step on the keys as you go up. Um, and that had a significant effect on the number of people who actually use the stairs rather than the escalator. 
So there's a huge amount of potential to use behavioral science and psychological understanding uh, for good. And all of this comes down to a principle in psychology, being that we are so-called cognitive misers. Uh, and what this means is, and I'll expand on it a bit more, is that we have very limited attention spans. We have limited cognitive energy. We also have limited time, limited physical effort, limited motivation uh, to put into decisions. Uh, so putting conscious effort into decisions um, is not something that we really have the ability or the energy to do. Um, and this comes down to a theory which is a little outdated, a little simplified, but brain imaging research suggests it's still generally true, is the trying brain theory. So if you were to cut into a cliff face, you would see different layers of rock that have formed over time. So maybe a volcano erupted over a beach and that turned into uh, sandstone and granite. I'm not a geologist. Um, uh, the, the same is true of the brain, where different regions uh, developed over time and with it evolved different functions with those regions. So broadly speaking, you have three regions. Uh, here you have the brainstem and the cerebellum, which is the uh, so-called reptilian brain, responsible for things like instincts, keeping your heart rate going, uh, keeping your body temperature stable, and so on. Then you have here the mammalian brain, responsible for things like emotion, uh, social processes, learning, and so on. And then finally, around the outside, you have the cerebral cortex, which is the, uh, the human brain, responsible for more abstract, advanced things like uh, thinking ahead, language, uh, thinking abstractly, and so on. Uh, now, these tend to be split into the old, evolutionarily older brain, system one, it's called, and then uh, system two, the new brain. So you're probably aware of this, conscious versus non-conscious. A uh, good analogy, I think, is uh, Spock and Kirk. So one of them, Spock, is very cool-headed, logical, thinks things through, whereas Kirk is very intuitive and hot-headed and emotional and does things uh, on instinct. Uh, so most people know about this conscious-non-conscious split, um, but a lot of people aren't aware of uh, kind of the weighting of the split. So if you think about everything that the brain can do, how much of it do you think is conscious? So everything the brain processes in a single second, how much of that do you think goes through conscious pathways? So who would say 100% um, is conscious? Okay, who would say less than 100% is conscious? And keep those hands up if you think less than 90%, uh, less than 75%, less than 50, less than 30, less than 10, less than 5, Less than one. Okay. Uh, so some neuroscientists were asked the same thing, but just to draw it on a piece of paper. Imagine that sheet of paper represents everything the brain can do. How much do you think is conscious, and how much do you think is unconscious? Wow, that's an interesting question. How much is conscious and how much is not conscious? You're not serious. You are? Now that's a very tricky thing to do. That is very interesting. I guess if I had to guess, <laughs> I would say that if this is everything the brain can do, about this much is conscious. Um, I would say maybe have something like that out of the whole bit of paper. I would say about this much is conscious. So if this whole sheet of paper was okay. Well, I will probably draw something small in the middle, like that, just to represent the conscious bit. That's my guess. I have no idea. Scientists agree that the role played by your conscious mind is much smaller than previously thought. Which raises a puzzling question. Are you in control of your unconscious? Or is it in control of you? So, um... It's very hard, if not impossible, to kind of put a number on the split because the two systems are very much interlinked and work with one another. 
Uh, however, researchers have tried. So one researcher looked at all of the uh, sensory neurons that fire in the brain every second, and he found that uh, there are 11 million that fire in general, uh, but only 40 of those go through conscious pathways, meaning 0.004% of sensory processing is conscious, uh, by this estimate at least. So the vast majority of the processing that your brain is doing is subconscious. So if, for example, right now, uh, you're paying attention to me, hopefully, uh, but you're not paying attention to that slight humming sound. But now you are, because I pointed it out. So, but your brain is filtering this all out at a very low level. Um, so imagine you're at a very noisy cocktail party, and there's music and people talking and glasses clinking and so on. And uh, imagine your name's Bob, and across the room you hear somebody say, I really can't stand Bob. You, you will hear that conversation and what that person said, even though you weren't paying attention to it. Uh, because your brain was processing everything at a very low level. Um, I've seen estimates go up to 30% is conscious, but the, the main takeaway is that most of it is non-conscious. So just remember who it is that's in charge of the enterprise. It's Captain Kirk. It's the emotional one that's in charge. Um, and this is summarized quite nicely by a quote, uh, where thought conflicts with emotion, the latter is designed by the neural circuitry in our brains to win. So because the older parts of the brain have been around for longer and ensured our survival for longer, they tend to dominate over reason. So emotion tends to dominate over reason. Uh, for example, hopefully this wasn't just me, but when you were a kid, did you hear that if you uh, kept your eyes open when you sneezed, your eyeballs would pop out of your head? Did anyone else hear that? And did you try and do it? Yeah, but you can't do it, right? Uh, so you can't consciously stop that blinking from happen happening any more than you could kind of consciously concentrate and stop your heart from beating. So the emotional brain tends to take uh, precedence. And it's important to remember that's uh, true today, even with the amazing technology that we will have at our disposal. Uh, we, you know, we have these amazing smartphones and the internet, and what do we use it for? Uh, cat videos. Uh, getting in arguments with strangers and uh, pornography are probably the main things, uh, traffic-wise. Um, so we're still very much driven by these emotional, uh, subconscious, evolutionary uh, factors, even though we have this amazingly advanced technology. And of course, there's lots of examples of this. Uh, there was this famous or infamous Facebook study where they found that if you post uh, positively charged um, content to people's news feeds, they end up posting positively charged um, status updates uh, and vice versa for negative effect. So people are kind of emotionally influenced by the technology they use. And all of this uh, summed up with another nice quote used by evolutionary psychologists, our modern skulls house a stone age brain. So even though we have all this technology, we live in contemporary times, uh, we still have that, you know, that monkey brain, that caveman brain. Uh, that's very impulsive and emotional and driving our behavior. Now, this study is a great example of just how limited uh, the conscious rational mind can be. So participants were asked to memorize a number, either a two-digit number or a seven-digit number, which they would be quizzed on later. So they had to keep it in their short-term memory, um, which was cognitively effortful. Uh, while they were memorizing the number, they were offered a snack to say thank you, and they could choose between a cake and some fruit. So under normal conditions with the two-digit number, uh, do you think most people chose cake or fruit? Uh, who would say cake and fruit? Um, so it was actually, it was fruit. Whereas under the other conditions, uh, it was a seven-digit number, uh, most people chose cake. Because uh, choosing fruit is the rational thing to do. It takes effort, uh, you kind of have to force yourself to do it. Everyone loves cake, right? Um, so that's what your emotional, impulsive brain wants to do, but you have to kind of inhibit that impulse and choose fruit instead. But all it takes is a seven-digit number uh, for your conscious brain to kind of be tired out uh, or distracted and for the emotional monkey brain to take over and make an emotional choice. So with bearing in mind how limited the conscious mind can be, uh, there's certain upshots of that in terms of how we process information and respond to information. 
And this video is a nice illustration of that. Uh, some of you may have seen it before, so, so don't uh, give away the answer if you know it. But otherwise, there's two teams passing the balls to each other. One of them is wearing, uh, one of the teams is wearing white, and one of the teams is wearing black. And see if you can correctly count the number of times the players wearing white pass the ball to one another. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you get that? Did you spot the gorilla? <laughs> For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? <laughs> Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. So we're uh, very limited in the amount of information we can consciously process. And as you can probably imagine, uh, this can be a problem when we have all this information and choice uh, available to us, thanks to the internet and so on. Um, for example, there's a number in psychology called Dunbar's number, uh, so we can only really have around 150 friends. Uh, our brain's just not big enough to really con uh, to process more people than that. However, on LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter, I'm sure we all have uh, more than 150 so-called friends. Uh, so how do our limited uh, minds deal with all of that information and choice? Well, uh, the answer is heuristics, so shortcuts, rules of thumb, that allow us to make decisions on autopilot and allow us to react to situations without thinking. So imagine that it's uh, 10 p.m. on a Saturday night and you, your phone is ringing and you have a look and it's your boss's boss, uh, let's say um, the head of Google France. Uh, how do you feel? Worried. Stressed, right? Worried. Pretty worried and nervous, anxious, and that's a feeling that you'd feel straight away. Um, so this uh, chap explains that pretty well. So imagine caller ID, and you see from the caller, it's 10 o'clock Saturday night, that it's the chairman of the board of your company, or your boss's boss. What happens? How long does it take for your heartbeat to start racing? Mm -hmm. right? Did you have a whole calculation going through all the math, or did it happen instantly? It happens instantly. And we go from this person is calling, to I'm in trouble, to they figured out I'm truly a fraud, to I'm going to be fired, I am never going to get another job because I'm going to be blackballed. I am not going to have enough to eat. I'm going to die. And it, so, <laughs> caller ID to dead in less than a second. And we can prove this, right? That's not your conscious brain up here. That's the amygdala, the lizard brain. So another example, let's say you go to a city in another country for a business trip, and you're there for one night. And you have a look, and you can only find two restaurants to eat at, um, these two. Who would rather eat at the one on the left? Right? And you know that instantly. Uh, you don't have to look at the menu or ask around or look at reviews online. You know if it's busy, it must be good. Uh, and these are the kind of shortcuts and heuristics that we use to navigate the world without having to think everything through. So a heuristic is a, a rule of thumb, basically, such as red equals stop. So when you approach a red light, your body knows automatically to put all those uh, car stopping behaviors into action. And this is why uh, one study found that people eat less food when it's served on red plates. So when it comes to clothing, um, clothes likewise can be used in uh, heuristic ways. Uh, and we, we make perceptual and behavioral cues without thinking. So for example, um, this, uh, this ice hockey team, once they changed their uniform from white to black, uh, they uh, were given more penalties by the referees. Uh, so they were kind of perceived a certain way for dressing in black clothing. Um, 
And this is due to something in psychology called priming. So when you see something, that will activate certain thoughts in your head, which will ripple out to other ideas and thoughts that are connected to it. So let's say you see a chair, the idea of a chair will be activated in your brain, and then that will ripple out to uh, connected ideas, like a table, a cushion, and then so on, like throwing a pebble in a pond. Um, and a nice kind of early study which illustrated this had people do what's called a scrambled sentence task. So they had to unscramble sentences and make them into proper sentences, four or five words. Um, but some of the sentences had words relating to politeness, and some of the sentences uh, for other participants in other condition, there was words relating to rudeness, and then there was a control group with just neutral words. Um, and then they were told, when you finish doing that, come and hand the survey back to the researcher. And the researcher was uh, an actor instruct instructed to talk to another participant, also an actor, and just to keep talking for five minutes and see if the original participant would interrupt the conversation or not. And they found that uh, if they read polite words, they were significantly less likely to interrupt. Uh, but if they read rude words, they were more likely to interrupt because those ideas and behaviors had been activated. Likewise, in the same paper, they found that reading words related to the elderly made people walk more slowly away from the study afterwards. And applying this to clothing, um, an experiment used the Stroop test as a measure of cognitive function. So rather than explain the Stroop test, I'm just going to uh, get you to do it. So I'm going to show you some words. All I want you to do is read out the color of the words. So for example, this would be green. This would be, yeah, and, okay. All right, you ready? See, it's hard. It's hard to uh, distinguish between the word and the color of the word. And so this test is used as a measure of cognitive function, your ability to discriminate between uh, incoming sources of information and switch between them. Uh, and what they found was in this study that if you get people to wear a lab coat, they actually perform better on this task. Um, not only that, but if they, were, if they were told that it was a painter's coat, the same item of clothing, uh, it didn't have the same effect. And if uh, compared to if it was, they were told it was a doctor's coat, and also they had to actually wear it for it to have an effect, uh, simply seeing it didn't work. Um, and another study did the same kind of procedure and had people wear a nurse's scrub, and that made them uh, more empathic when they saw somebody else in distress and quicker to help somebody who needed help. Uh, and again, the same item of clothing, being told it's a cleaner scrub, uh, there wasn't the effect there. So um, if you're told it's a nurse's outfit and you wear it, it basically makes you more caring. Um, and that goes back to priming, so how clothing can activate certain ideas and influence perception and behavior as a result. Another nice example, um, these participants were given a test to do, and then they were given the answers and asked to mark it themselves and give, give themselves a score. Uh, but what the researchers did was then they would look at the test paper themselves and see what they actually scored. So to see if there's a difference between how they marked themselves and how they should actually be marked. Um, and while they were doing the test, they were given sunglasses to wear. Half of the participants wore uh, branded sunglasses and the other half, they were counterfeit brands. And they found that if people wear counterfeit sunglasses, their true score isn't any different, so they perform the same. But for some reason, when they self-report it and mark themselves, uh, they score a lot higher. So in other words, wearing uh, counterfeit sunglasses made these people more likely to cheat on the test. So clothing can affect us. It can affect our behavior and how we perceive the world. But it can also affect how other people perceive us. Um, and one study uh, which demonstrated this quite nicely, but I want to show you this video so you understand it first. The ASH experiment is one of psychology's oldest and most popular pieces of research. A volunteer is told that he's taking part in a visual perception test. What he doesn't know is that the other participants are actors and he's the only person taking part in the real test, which is actually about group conformity. Please begin. The experiment you will be taking part in today involves the perception of line length. 
Your task will be simply to look at the line here on the left and indicate which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. So, for example... If you the actors right have been told to match the wrong lines. The volunteer will be monitored to see if he gives the correct answer or if he goes along with the opinion of the group and gives the wrong answer. In the first test, the correct answer is to... Uh, one. 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 Two. One. Once again, the correct answer is two. Three. 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 I'm sure we all like to think we would never do that. Um, but when it comes to clothing, they did this experiment and they had, uh, first of all, they manipulated group size and they found that the more people giving the wrong answer, the more likely you are to comply. Makes sense, there's group pressure. Um, but also, if the people giving the wrong answer were wearing black, uh, people were more likely to uh, comply and give the wrong answer. Um, I guess that's why police wear black. Um, it seems an authoritative um, color. Um, similarly, um, asking people to take part in the survey, uh, if people wear a suit and tie, uh, the people being asked are more likely to agree and to take part in the survey. Uh, so something as simple as what people are wearing can have a big impact on uh, how they behave. And in sports, teams who wear red are more likely to win than teams who wear blue. Uh, red, an aggressive color associated with blood probably, uh, it has a high frequency, so it's quite a stimulating color um, and it's probably quite uh, intimidating when you come up against it whereas blue is on the other end of the spectrum uh, frequency wise and then a kooky uh, example um, in this study uh, the researcher had men uh, asking women out on the street uh, so smiling at them and asking them for a drink and the women were more likely to smile back and also to agree for a drink if the man was wearing a fireman's uniform <laughs> so you can keep that one um, and so a related principle in psychology is something called thin slices. Um, and this is, again, an example of heuristic processing and using cues without thinking. Um, so if I were to give you a very thin slice of a cake, you could tell me exactly, pretty much exactly, what the rest of the cake looks like uh, without having seen it, just based on that one thin slice. And in the same way, we can make very accurate predictions about people based on a thin slice of their behavior. So if you see their bedroom or their office, or their clothing, or their Spotify playlist, or whatever, uh, you can make quite accurate inferences about their personality and how they're likely to behave based on that thin slice. For example, a counselor had some newlyweds he was seeing, and he videotaped them talking to one another for about 15 minutes. He coded the uh, tapes for certain behaviors, and what he found was he was able to predict to an 83% accuracy whether they would get divorced or not within a few years, based on just this 15-minute uh, tape. Um, and those things that predicted uh, divorce are here, just in case. Uh, I recently got engaged, so it's very useful information for me. Um, criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. Uh, but they're accurate, these, uh, these impressions that they make, we make. These thin slices are accurate. So within a tenth of a second uh, in this study, people could predict ac uh, personality to about 70% uh, accuracy. Um, and then not only were these first impressions accurate, but they also persisted. So having more time uh, didn't make a difference to people's perceptions of, personal of a person's personality. So as I said, some examples of thin slices might be a bedroom. So what type of person, for example, uh, Personality-wise, do you think lives in this bedroom? Huh? Sorry? Uh, messy, maybe? Extroverted, outgoing? Um, and this one? Yeah. Yes, yeah, organized, maybe, possibly neurotic. Now, if I was to tell you... Um, that one of these is actually my bedroom. Uh, which one do you think it is? Who, who would say this one? And who would say this one? 
It's actually neither, but it's good to know. <laughs> good to know what you think of me. The reason we can tell from a bedroom somebody's personality, um, and this, sorry, this is, uh, there is a study which does this, by the way. It shows people uh, bedrooms, offices, um, uh, GeoCities websites, I think. It's quite an old study. Um, and found that you could predict personality quite uh, reliably, accurately, from them. Um, and this is because our behavior uh, is driven by underlying dispositions, which usually have a kind of neurological basis. So extroversion as a personality trait, for example. Uh, extroverts are happy, uh, outgoing, gregarious, excitement-seeking, uh, quite active, uh, optimistic, and so on largely because they have uh, increased volume in the region of the brain that deals with reward processing. So in other words, they're more sensitive to rewards uh, rather than potential losses and threats. And so you can see how this makes them uh, quite sensation-seeking because they enjoy life and they, they get reward from it, um, quite active and outgoing and so on. Um, but what this underlying trait allows you to do is uh, predict behavior and also infer the trait from behaviors. So you can see if somebody has faded shoes, smiles a lot, and listens to pop music, they're probably more likely to be extroverted. And this is all based on research. So faded shoes, perhaps because they're quite active, so they move around a lot. Uh, smiling, as you can imagine, they're quite optimistic. And listening to pop music because they're uh, sensation-seeking. Um, and then from this, you can predict more longer-term behaviors. So if they're an extrovert, which you know from this, then they're more likely to uh, excel in a sales role and they're also more likely to be very sociable. So you can infer traits from, from behaviors this way. For example, if somebody likes very bitter food, like dark chocolate and gin, they're more likely to be disagreeable. Uh, and conversely, if somebody likes sweet food, they're more likely to be agreeable. Um, and then you can use that to predict certain behavior. So agreeable people are more likely to say yes to an orgy when asked. Um, so if somebody really likes sweet food, uh, what does that say? Um, and conscientious people are much less likely to say yes. I guess they really do need structure in their lives. Even whether someone's a dog person or a cat person, uh, you can tell with their personality or you can use to tell their personality. So cat people tend to be more uh, creative, um, whereas dog people tend to be more kind of friendly, more extroverted and agreeable. Um, and even uh, political personality traits can be inferred from behaviors and interests. There's a great um, study or quiz on time, which I would advise you to check out, but you are asked 10 questions and it can predict your left-right leaning based on these 10 seemingly unrelated questions. Uh, so um, politically liberal people prefer cats to dogs. Uh, they prefer documentaries to action movies, um, but they are less likely to keep their desk organized. Clothing, of course, is one key that can be used as well. Um, uh, so this study, this is a study that found that extroverts are more likely to have faded shoes. Neurotic people have very uh, clean, um, non-faded shoes. Uh, extroverts wear high tops. There's all these kind of cues that you can infer from clothing, as well as even facial structure and uh, music interests and so on. Uh, and now where this gets interesting is obviously if you can see what clothes somebody's buying then you, online, then you can predict behavior, but there's a huge uh, kind of digital footprint out there that can be used to infer personality as well. So there's a famous study uh, where Facebook likes uh, were used to predict personality. Can't really do that anymore. Um, but what they found was, for example, somebody who likes Indiana Jones on Facebook, satisfied with their life. Somebody in the West who likes anime is more likely to be introverted. Somebody who likes the Adams family more likely to be neurotic. And once you, if you're able to uh, analyze this likes data, you can predict personality very, very well. In fact, uh, so if the average number of likes that are able to be analyzed was about, uh, mm, about 200, just under 200, um, that average amount of likes predicts someone's personality more accurately than a work colleague, a friend, a flatmate, or a family member. So Facebook likes are more uh, actually accurate than all of those people. Um, and the only one it comes second to is a spouse, 
Uh, so only your spouse knows you better than Facebook does. <laughs> However, if uh, you have more likes, um, then it knows you even better than your spouse. So about 300 likes is how many it needs to, to predict your personality better than your spouse can. If there's Facebook, there's also, uh, as an example, uh, telecoms um, information, so what apps people use. So for example, if someone used LinkedIn, Evernote, and the Times app, they're more likely to be conscientious. If they use Tinder, betting, and WebMD, uh, then they're more likely to be neurotic. Uh, and this understanding of personality can be used to make messages which people uh, actually like more, and they respond to better, and which kind of vibe with them better. So if you know someone's personality, you know what kind of aesthetics they like to see. So this is some work I did for an art re retailer, an online art retailer, and I found that uh, people who are open to experience like art that's very kind of reflective and you have to think about and it's quite novel and unusual. Conscientious people like structured, ordered art that does what it says on the tin. So flowers, portraits, landscapes, that kind of thing. Extroverts like their aesthetics to be quite diverse and stimulating, diverse in shape and colour and so on. Uh, disagreeable people like morbid and intense edgy art, kind of the punk rock and the horror films of art. Mm, and neurotic people, as you can imagine, just like it gloomy. Similarly, for emojis, you can understand what kind of emojis would be best to use uh, with certain uh, people. So extroverts like the crown and the glasses clinking, as you can imagine. Disagreeable people like to use the shark and the devil. Um, neurotic people, again, just pretty gloomy. Um, and open people are quite cool. And of course, personalized advertising based on personality. Uh, is possible. So this was one of the early studies which was uh, kind of in the lab using a survey and it found that uh, if you personalize to the different personality traits that exist, people have a better, more positive self-reported response to the ads. They like the ad more. So if, for example, you say with the phone you'll always be where the excitement is and show people partying, uh, extroverts will like that more. If you say, use the phone to let people know you care and show people hugging, then agreeable people will like that more. So this was an early study which suggested that ads can be personalized to personality. And then more recently, uh, there was this study which actually did this on Facebook and found that, yes, uh, there is about a 50% uplift in conversion rate if you, um, 50 to 100% conversion lift, uh, if you personalize the personality. So again, extroverts with extroverted ads, is more effective and introverts with introverted ads is more effective. Um, so in terms of you know, uh, ethics and responsibility and so on, first of all, uh, you know, everyone is doing this. Now whether they should be or not, I'll get to later, but um, when I was at Cambridge Analytica in my first week uh, there, I heard someone say that Cambridge Analytica is like a strip club, everyone wants to go but no one wants to be seen there. Um, I think that's quite accurate for the use of data, that uh, everyone wants to do it, but nobody wants to kind of be seen doing it. Um, so everyone is doing it. The Obama campaign used it. Uh, they did a very similar thing. Um, so it's not a kind of uh, partisan issue. Spotify is an example. Uh, this is an article from over four years ago now, where they were using uh, music, um, the music you're listening to, to predict your mood and to target messages accordingly. And then I saw them speak at a conference and they're doing the same for personality now as well. Um, and Spotify gives us a clue as to what might be next. So I worked at a company that did facial coding and facial coding is now, uh, so facial coding of your emotions through your facial expressions, now available uh, through the iPhone technically. It can measure your facial expre expressions. That's how Memojis work. Um, and the study we did with facial coding, uh, we showed people music videos and measured their emotional response and also their self-reported response. And we could see there were certain things that people said they didn't really like, but when they listened to it, they actually had quite strong emotional engagement with it. Um, and this points to the potential future of analyzing people's emotions, not just their personalities and interests and so on, uh, and targeting messages that way. So uh, an era of uber personalization. So finally, the ethics, though. There's a lot that can be done with data, uh, but should it be? And the, there's five points uh, that I'd like to draw to your attention when it comes to using data. Um, so the first is hypofrontality. So this is the idea that bombarding people with uh, messages and speaking to their impulse and their kind of um, 
subconscious drivers um, may not actually be all that good for them. So there is this study on technological brain drain where if you have your mobile out on the desk while you're working, uh, your cognitive function is decreased. In other words, it's harder to concentrate um, because uh, it's distracting. Uh, we only, remember, we only have so much kind of conscious energy and attention, uh, and the mobile kind of drains that uh, and makes us more impulsive as a result. And this study found that uh, extreme excessive smartphone use is associated with the kind of brain changes you see in addiction, the inability to inhibit impulses and so on. And if we are sending emotional uh, messages to people all the time, what kind of effect is that going to have? Remember how we can be primed to certain behaviors and thoughts? Uh, so if you're sending people emotional messages, it's likely to make them emotional. So this study found that if you offer people a whimsical, cute, emotional cookie, cookie they're more likely to choose it and be unhealthy uh, rather than a salad because you're priming an emotional uh, kind of monkey brain way of thinking. And so what effect is bombarding people with emotional messages potentially going to have? The second thing to bear in mind is remember that we're cognitive misers with limited attention spans. Uh, so in the Apple uh, terms and conditions, you're not allowed to use it to make nuclear weapons. Did anyone know that? I certainly didn't. So we just don't read the uh, terms and conditions usually. We just don't have the attention span, the, the, F, the energy to do it. And maybe this is why you know, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, did it really have an effect on behavior in the end? I know a few people who deleted their accounts, but by and large, I don't think uh, it really did because we just don't have the energy. All of us, none of us, have the energy and the cognitive brain power and the attention spans. We're too busy, too tired. We've got more important things to think about than to read a uh, privacy notice. Uh, the third thing to bear in mind is that we're all uh, easily manipulated and uh, you know, it's quite a dangerous thing, potentially. So in 2013, Aerosmith's song spiked on Spotify and Mars bars sales increased. Um, and the reason is because the planet Mars was in the news. Uh, so it's another example of priming. Uh, seeing Mars in the news activated ideas of Mars and also that song from uh, Armageddon and made people listen to Aerosmith and buy Mars bars. Um, also, uh, the Werther effect um, is where the suicide rate goes up after a highly publicized suicide. Um, so we are very, you know, uh, open to being nudged, and it's something that we need to be very responsible about. Um, and then the fourth thing to bear in mind is that we all reject unfairness, and this is a great um, experiment which just shows how evolutionarily hardwired that is. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece he eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests a rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. So we're really hardwired to reject unfairness. And when there's a power imbalance between those who hold our data and ourselves, whose data it is, uh, that really invokes a strong emotional hardwired reaction with us. Um, and the fifth and final thing is uh, that we all really don't like creepiness. Um, and this study found that the most creepy um, profession is a clown, which you can probably imagine, uh, followed by a taxidermist and a sex shop owner. Um, and the research found that the main driver of perceived creepiness is ambiguity about the presence of threat. So in other words, if we're not sure what our data is being used for, uh, how much data do they have, what do they know about us, um, then it's creepy, and we really don't like that. Um, so uh, just one final point I want to make is that underlying all of these five things is the need for self-esteem. 
and that we need to feel that we have control over the world and we have agency um, and we're not kind of being uh, influenced against our will. Um, and this is very important for well-being and health. So people who have high uh, power and status, uh, so high self-esteem, they do better on even behavioral tasks like getting a hole in one on a, on a, on a crazy golf course. Uh, people who are high in self-esteem, when they're asked to draw a target, this is the one they draw versus the low self-esteem one, so they do better on tasks and put more time and effort into it. Uh, they have lower stress levels, and they may even live longer. So compared to nominees, winners of Oscars live 3.6 years longer, and Nobel Prizes one and a half years longer. So overall, when it comes to ethics and responsibility, it's about being fair and honest, uh, but most importantly, giving people control. Thank you.